Wasting Climate Change wishes to thank all of the sponsors supporting the conference. This specific seminar is made possible by The moderator for this seminar is Michel Bouffard. Michel is the founder of Tasting Climate Change, an author, a wine educator, and a journalist. She recently co-wrote a book called Quel Vin Pour Demain, which was published last September by Duneau. The book explores solutions for the wine industry to adapt and mitigate climate change. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the third edition of Tasting Climate Change. Usually, if there were no COVID, we would be in the same room um, sharing um, talks and over a glass of wine. Um, unfortunately, uh, this was not possible, but I would say fortunately, uh, not because of COVID, but I think this is more aligned with Tasting Climate Change, which means you can listen to us all over the world and you did not have to take a flight or plane uh, to come and listen to the expert today. I'm often asked how Tasting Climate Change came about. Um, I first started to get interested in the topic in 2006 when I watched the documentary of Al Gore, The Inconvenient Fruit. At the time, I was doing my diploma for the Wine and Spirit Educational Trust and they were asking me to do a research paper on a specific topic, and that's what I chose. And it was not a time where everyone was talking about it, so finding information was very difficult. And I told myself one day when I have more knowledge and I know more people who have knowledge, and I'm further along in, my, in the wine industry, I will create something that people can, um, they can look at for resource. And that's how I created Tasting Climate Change in 2017. Um, the other reason is I think that the wine industry is very fragmented and sometimes uh, we don't connect the dots together. Uh, the sommeliers are busy running the floor, uh, the viticulturist is busy with the vines, but I do believe that if we all communicate together from the vineyard to the glass, that we can all work together to find solution. This year I co-wrote a book and um, during the research for the book, it reminded me how uh, the world is filled with solution and the only thing that's stopping us from going faster is really because we're not communicating the solution together. Um, the other thing that really gave me hope this year is regenerative agriculture. It's something that we've been talking about for a while um, but I watched a documentary earlier in the year called Kiss the Ground. And I think I watched the documentary about three times. And it talks about how uh, the agriculture and, of course, viticulture can have a big role in uh, mitigating climate change. If we work the soil properly, we can sequestrate the carbon. So I could not think of three better people to talk about regenerative agriculture with me today. Uh, three experts that I've had the pleasure to know over the years and actually helped me a lot uh, during, uh, during the research for my book. So first, Guillaume Barreau. Um, Guillaume is Assistant Director at Château et Domaine Gérard Bertrand. Agriculture engineer and enologist by conviction, he made the choice really early on to dedicate his career to the environment. Um, he started his collaboration with Gérard Bertrand in 2015 and he joined the company full-time in 2018. Uh, Domaine Gérard Bertrand today has 16 wineries and 900 acre or certified demeter. Miguel Torres, uh, what can I say? Uh, the family has been so good to me and I've had the pleasure to, to visit many times and they were always fundamental to um, to my research with climate change, always very generous with their knowledge. Um, last, at the last conference, uh, Miguel Torres, the father, was actually the keynote speaker at the conference. So Miguel, I'm very happy to, to have you for this edition. Um, Miguel joined the family business as a manager at the Jean Léon Winery in 2001 and has been involved in the, in the company uh, all along the way. And in 2018, Miguel became general manager at Familia Torres. 
Uh, as you know, the Torres family has always been a pioneer in everything they did. And of course, today, what is the most pressing issue is climate change, and they are a pioneer in that regard. Uh, I don't know any other company who has invested so much time, energy, and money in research, and most importantly, in sharing with everyone uh, the knowledge that they found for climate change. And lastly, but not last, uh, Johan Reneke from Reneke. Uh, Johan, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we might have some disruption with the, uh, we, they had a power shutdown this morning in South Africa. So we are on their uh, our generators, so we might lose him, and, but he will come back if we do. Um, I went to visit uh, Reneke uh, many years ago and I think it's one of the most touching human story I've ever heard. Uh, when we talk about regenerative agriculture, uh, we cannot leave behind the people we work with. And um, Johan Reneke actually did his postgraduate degree in philosophy and always took an interest in the environmental ethics. So um, it will be very interesting to talk about you know, how you work in a collaborative way uh, with people, especially when you're in South Africa and things are not always easy uh, financially. So thanks everyone. We will start with Guillaume, uh, Guillaume from Gérard Bertrand. Um, we'll have a lot of discussion along the way when it comes to regenerative agriculture, but I do know that at Gérard Bertrand, the choice of being biodynamic is one of your answer to uh, Regener reg regenerative agriculture. It's very hard work to say in French. Um, so uh, Guillaume, uh, I'll leave it with you. Uh, if you can take us to uh, the great work you do at Gérard Bertrand. You need to un unmute your, your microphone. I think your, your microphone is muted. I think your microphone is... Oui, bon, c'est parfait. Oui, c'est super. C'est bon. Ouais. <laughs> Hello. Th thank you a lot, Michel. It's a really pleasure to be with you today uh, to share uh, this moment, special moment. You know, we just finished the 2021 harvest and, uh, and then it's a new vintage. And uh, today it's a big, uh, big speech about uh, regenerative agriculture. Uh, I, that's clear that for me, I will present uh, regenerative agriculture uh, by the sea of biodynamics. And to explain why, you know, uh, how you, we can have always 880 hectares in biodynamics now. And the story is a 20 years, uh, 20 year story. Uh, so for me, I will show you, you know, some technical point because uh, I am, as you said, the deputy director, so I am an agronomist. I am also an allergist. I am uh, the son of farmer. So, you know, it's very, I think will be very interesting to share with, with you uh, the experience of Gérard Bertrand, but also my experience in South of France. So uh, that's clear that today we have a, a referential position in biodynamic. Uh, and uh, that's why for, for, for me, it's very interesting to explain, to show uh, how our practice uh, can change uh, and how our, the, 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 we can see the, the, the regeneration of the farm of the biodiversity. Next. So in this map, you can see the 16 estates. Uh, that all are located in uh, the south of France between Montpellier and Carcassonne. So as you can see, it's a mosaic of terroir. We have the chance to have some the most beautiful terroir uh, of France. We have some schist, we have some limestone, we have some uh, influence of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, some oceanic influence. So, for, for me, it's a, it's a very beautiful space to, to, to explain the biodiversity and to, to have the, some of the, the most beautiful and powerful terroir. And that's me, for, for me, it's very important to, to, to spend this moment because uh, that's clear that we have 180 hectares in biodynamic, but for me, I have 16 different estates. And so I have 16 ways of biodynamics. Because, of course, 
uh, for example, that's clear that for me, I will apply the Maria Tunes Doug compost in all my estates and quite at the same date. But at the reverse, uh, for example, the horn silica, I will uh, apply it, for example, in spring for the Domaine de l'Aigle because we have some oceanic influence. And in all the estates, this on silica, I will apply it in most during the ripening of the grape. So that's why for, for me, uh, and that's why it's not a unique story of biodynamics, but different story. And that's why uh, my, my, my mean it's very important is to say that uh, the change can be allowed uh, support by only one person, Gérard Bertrand, but by all the team that will explain you in, this, in the presentation. Next. <clears throat> so in this timeline, uh, for me, it's very interesting because the story, it's not a 20 year story, but a, a century story because in 1920, the Gérard Bertrand grandmother, Paul Bertrand, plants a first plot, a plot of Carignan. Uh, and in this time, the vine was lit in organic way. And then, a few years later, in 1973, uh, Gérard Bertrand, Georges, the, the father of Gérard Bertrand, acquires the Château de Villemajou. But the timeline starts, uh, as you can see, in 2002, when Gérard read the book of Rudolf Steiner and uh, was very convinced by the, the, the power of the, of the plant, of the homeotherapy for him because he has uh, some illness and cured by this homeotherapy. And he thinks that we have to change the way to produce. So that's why in 2002, he decided to start biodynamics in one plot of Chardonnay in Domaine de Sigalus. The plot was uh, three uh, hectares. And then we can see in few years the change uh, in the soil. We can change in the biodiversity, in the environment, the benefit effect of this uh, agriculture and make that two years later, he decided to convert all the Domaine de Sigalus. And that's why you can see in 2014, for me, it was my beginning in the Gérard Bertrand uh, adventure because I joined as consultant uh, the, the group. We decided to convert step by step all the estates. And that makes that in 2018, all the 16 estates are now convert in biodynamic farming. And as a result, I think uh, in 2021, Gérard Bertrand was elected Green Personality of the Year. And I think that you can see that this uh, award is a long, it's a long way. And uh, for, for me, it's, uh, it's good to have these uh, recognitions. Next. So for, 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 for all people, uh, that's clear that uh, the expansion of biodynamics can be some weird because, you know, it's uh, in, two, in 2002, we start with only one cent and only one plot. And, you know, you can see that how long the, the way is because it's a, it's a way of 20 years. We have all the estates, all the plot, 880 hectares in biodynamic. So, for, for me, uh, that was explained, it's the, that this change is begin with two men, Gérard Bertrand and Gilles de Baudus. You know, the, it was at this time, and this time it was the manager of Sigalus Estates. And then we have also Richard Planas, the manager of the, all the estates. And we can see that thanks to the conviction, and it's a, it's a changing in the time, all the Gérard Bertrand group, so that now it's 350 collaborators. And for me, I have the chance to have 80 experts, for ex the 80 experts is all the people that work with me, are involved 
in this change and are all involved in this way of organic farming. So uh, I, I just want to spend a moment with you uh, with a little anecdote because uh, uh, this changing, I, I have the, the good illustration with uh, uh, Jean-Marie Catari. I don't have the, the picture on my uh, presentation because he is shy, so that way I, I, I don't have so. But this man uh, is now the manager of Chateau uh, Aigueville, one of our estates in uh, Corbia Boutonac. And this man is uh, people working uh, in the conventional agriculture, like a cooperative world. You know, it's in south of France, we have a lot of cooperative. And so the way to produce is to put some chemical and to make some uh, massive wine. And so for him, it was a big change, you know. He arrived in 2017 and uh, all, we said no chemical product now. And for me, it was very interesting because that's clear that at the beginning, it was, you know, surprise. And you have to, you know, uh, to redo, to uh, unlearn, to stop the knowledge that you have and learn other knowledge. And that's for me, the, 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 we can see that this changing is uh, in the good way. It's that clear that now Jean-Marie can go back and can go do some viticulture uh, in conventional and is one of my most uh, convinced manager in biodynamic. The next. So that's clear that uh, for, for, for me, it's very important Gérard Bertrand have the, to share this expertise because, and to share to all the Languedoc region that it can be possible uh, to have the viticulture in uh, this way of viticulture. So that's why we can say that, yeah, today we have uh, 20 years of experience uh, in organic farming and that's this knowledge we want to share with uh, all the experts of the region. And that's why now, uh, we have 80 active partners that allow that we have this six level of certification, conversion in agriculture biologique, uh, CAB, that's it's the first, that is the level of the changing, you know. Uh, and then when the changing, uh, after three years, we have organic label, we have also the uh, node added sulfite label for the wine, the vegan. Be friendly, I will uh, tell more in the, at the end of the presentation. And to finish, biodynamic, the top of the pyramids. Next. So just to, to sum up all the, these uh, social points is to uh, do, how do we create this community commitment? You know, how we can in 20 years have this commitment uh, and shared with my 80 person that work all day with me. So for me, uh, I, I, I can explain the changing. For me, it's a, it's a cycle, you know. The first of the cycle is awareness, you know, is to take into account the situation, uh, to uh, have with a pragmatic and uh, objective point the description of the situation. And for us, it's that, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't have a good impact of the environment, so we have to stop chemical product and, and find another way to produce. Then, after the awareness, is a decision. So we take the decision to change. Now, in 2000, 2020, we change. We, 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 we take this decision and we can go back. Then it is a dynamic of the changing, you know, and to maintain it, you know, because when you change, that's clear that sometimes that you, you have some trouble, but then after the trouble, after that you can find the, the some good point, you have the changing and you have the benefit of the changing. And then for me, the end of the cycle, it is the behavior, the, the attitude, and the conviction that we can transmit to other people. Okay, I leave this story, I show that, I show that, but now I can tell you that it's the, the, the true way. So, and 
this cycle in this uh, slide, you can go, go to one person, to another person, to another person. So that's why for, for me, it's, uh, it, it, this social dimension is very important. I don't go uh, explain more because I'm sure that uh, uh, you and will see, say more, uh, but for me, uh, it will be very, it is very important to share uh, this experience and that biodynamic, organic, uh, and regenerative agriculture have a social dimension uh, that we have to share. So today, just to, uh, to, to present my definition of uh, regenerative agriculture and biodynamics, for me, uh, we have three pillars that I we show some example, soil management, plant use, and biodiversity. Next. So to have a, a good wine and to have a, a good agriculture, you have to maintain the soil and to have the soil in good be, uh, health. So that's why uh, I can say at the, at the beginning. So next. As an example of uh, biodynamic and uh, my first decision in the A states uh, was to sowing, you know, to put some vegetal cover in the vineyard. And that can be crazy because, you know, in South of France, uh, in the belief of, uh, of uh, uh, plenty of viticulture, uh, we have to cut the grass. Grass is the best enemy of uh, viticulturists because we are in the South of France, so we have a lot of competition with water and nutrient. So that's why the, 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 the vine can go very clean. And my first decision, I don't say that at the beginning to Gérard Bertrand, but my first decision was to put some herbs in the vineyard. So that can be crazy, you know. And for, for, for me, uh, it's one of the best decisions because uh, thanks to this practice, thanks and completed with all the manure that we can put in biodynamic way, uh, also with the, the own manure, we can see that the, the, the microorganism uh, refill all the, the, the soil. And, uh, and for me, the, the landscape of this natural and vegetal cover uh, was very incredible. Uh, for the story, I, I select uh, each year, I select the, the, the seeds to have some, for example, a cereal for, for this year it was sorghum. Uh, other year I will select some legume plants and some crucifer. So each year it's not the same seeds and to make the, the, the well balance of the soil. So benefits are very visible. Uh, we have a protection in uh, skin, uh, it's, uh, we have the restitution of the nutrient for the, for the soil and, and uh, we regenerate the soil. So next, uh, just, <laughs> just to, to, to this practice, uh, we, have, we see the benefit just to show and to share uh, the study on INRAI, so it's the French uh, uh, Institute of uh, Research in France, uh, that show that the connection between, you know, we have a lot of connection between uh, fungus and between uh, bacteria and all the microorganisms of the soil. Uh, and uh, so it's a study of uh, Lionel Ranjar, so expert of soil uh, in Burgundy, and he studied 150 farm and showed that in organic farm, we have 1,700 links. In conventional, 1,400 links. And in bad biodynamic, we have 49,000 links. So we have a multiplication of 30, uh, things to the apply of, uh, of biodynamics uh, to the soil. Also, uh, just a word to say that uh, we participate because the dynamic of share, uh, we participate to uh, study to see the impact of traction, uh, animal traction of soil. So with EFV, so it's uh, Institute French Vine Institute. So we, we will uh, participate on it. Uh, next. So the plant's dimension, next. So 
that's why we use phytotherapy. So for, for example, we, we built our own plant dryer uh, to select the, 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 the plant. So phytotherapy is a medication to cure the, 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 the vine with the herbals. And for me, it's very uh, useful uh, technique because uh, even if the quantity of uh, uh, of the plants are very small, you know, in biodynamic, the power of the message is very strong. And in my career, I can see, you know, in some vineyard that use too many plants in the, not a good way have other uh, not negative impact. And at the reverse, good plant put in the right way have best it's the best treatment for the vine. Just next. To go further, uh, just I, I want to explain you the, the basics of sensitive uh, crystallization, but for me, it's a very uh, interesting tool uh, to understand uh, and to compare our practice. And so that's why we can see in uh, left side that uh, it's an example of uh, sensitive crystallization uh, that you can use with, uh, with wine, we can use with uh, sap flow, but that's very important to see that we want to, to meet the impact of our management and we complete uh, this, uh, this measure with, you know, normal uh, organic um, agronomic analysis, like soil, soil analysis, like uh, sap flow analysis, and also we use some weather stations. So, you know, in biodynamic, it's, it's a complexity, it's a... Uh, it's a combination between innovation and the, the sense of peace. So uh, at the, the surplus uh, pillar is biodiversity, so next. So an example of biodiversity, next um, is, uh, for example, we put some bee heaves on the vineyard that the bee are the, the best uh, uh, indicator of the health uh, of the environment. And as you can see, we can put it in all our vineyards thanks to the, the biodynamic. Uh, we also use animal presence, animal traction of the mule. It's a cross of horse and monkey, uh, agility of, uh, of uh, monkey and the strength of, uh, of horse. And it's a connection between the third rain, uh, vegetal, mineral, and, and animal. And also at the, the right side, you can see that we you agro pastoralism to 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 sheep herd uh, to mow uh, the grass during the, the winter in all the, the vineyards. It's a, another practice that we can use in all the estates. Uh, next. And to finish about biodiversity, it's an, uh, an example that we uh, create with our partner in Seven, so in, at the north of Montpellier. Uh, it's an initiative with uh, four uh, cooperatives uh, in collaboration with the Gérard Bertrand Group, uh, with the label Be Friendly that promote biodiversity, uh, for example, but by putting age growing and all the, the, all the uh, impact that promote and protect the pollinization insect. So next, to finish and to respect my time and uh, then share uh, with all my colleagues, uh, to going further, I just would finish to saying that uh, regenerative agriculture for me is these three pillars. Uh, and to promote these three pillars, it's uh, a soil with a, a lot of microbiological activity, uh, a plant in a good health, and in and preserve the biodiversity for the next generation. And for for me, um, these three pillars illustrate uh, very well uh, the art that Gérard Bertrand in, in inculcated me of the thousand and one detail of the wine until the plantation, uh, until the, the, the harvest. And uh, well managed these three pillars, you manage positively and you have the good management of the and good impact of, on the environment. And 
uh, in addition, that's clear that if all these uh, benefits uh, result in the wine. And for me, that's clear that biodynamic, I don't tell, but that's clear that for me, we show more freshness, more expression, and more the expression of the terroir because my role and all the, 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 the role of our manager is not to make the wine with the taste of something, but to make the wine with the taste of somewhere. So that's why we, 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 we continue and drive uh, towards this practice and to uh, adapt. Uh, and for me, this uh, best practice is uh, the best way to be adapted to the climate change. So, and to go further, uh, that's clear that for me, the other challenge for me and for all my team is to complexify the system, uh, to put, for example, polyculture in our farms, uh, to uh, make the, the, the cultivation and to mix the culture with olives, uh, for example, with, with uh, olive trees. Uh, so we have to go further, uh, like just vineyard management. And to... The, the, the finish word of the presentation, that's clear that it, it's, a, uh, it's the example, you know. Uh, I was a scientist, but I was very involved in this way of biodynamic. And I think that, yeah, today I be the chain for, 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 for Gérard Bertrand and Almighty be the chain. So it's your turn. <laughs> So thank you a lot for the present for your time, and uh, I hope that uh, all my presentations are all clear. Thank you a lot. Merci Guillaume. I think your presentation is very clear, but definitely lots and lots of questions came through while you were speaking. I think people want to know more. Uh, many of the questions you ask. I will be going uh, to those questions at the very end because I do know that some of those questions will also be answered as we go with the other speakers. And then at the end, I will go back to the questions that were not answered. Uh, but there's one question I want to ask you, Guillaume, right now. Uh, there was a question because we're going to talk about soil health uh, coming up. It's going to be one of the big uh, topic. Uh, and someone is asking, it seems to be more and more, more link between uh, the soil health, uh, biodynamic, I know you also mentioned the fungus, the mycorrhiza. Uh, and can you, can, can you, where can we find, people want to know where they can read more about this, they're very interested, uh, the link of, of the soil uh, biodynamic and also the fungus. Uh, so, 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 so for the soil age, that's clear that it's a very big question because, you know, uh, we have, you know, you have a lot of indicator in the soil, you know, you have the carbon. I think that uh, Miguel Torres wa wa was a lot of uh, knowledge about that. We have also uh, some uh, live in soil and to, uh, to uh, estimate it, it's quite difficult, but that's why we, for, for me, it's, uh, uh, and in Gérard Bertrand's story, that's clear that the first step of biodynamic waste was the changing in the soil. So, and the, these changing were visible, you know, you, ju you just need a fork, you know, and to put the fork in, uh, in the soil and to, you have just to estimate the number of worms, for example. And that's clear that the first impact was to see that uh, we are more warm in Sigalus than the conversion in, um, in biodynamic. And, but that's clear, we have, a, you know, you are a lot of changing, but this study you can show in, uh, in website, uh, I can f uh, go, uh, give you this uh, study, uh, and it's from Lionel Ranjar, and uh, that's clear that compare, you know, different uh, farming and show that uh, the, the, the links are strengths uh, in biodynamic compared to other systems. Uh, Guillaume, uh, I'm going to go to Miguel next, but maybe what you could do for us, if you put in the chat box um, the name of the person you just mentioned, uh, so that people can read and, and go and seek that information. That would be fantastic. Um, I also had some people asking about the recording. Yes, this is being recorded. All of the eight seminars are getting recorded. I know some of you, it's late in the night. Some of you are, got, are getting up in the middle of the night to watch it because you're in Australia, New Zealand. Um, so all of the eight seminars are getting recorded and you will receive a link on Wednesday and you can use that link and uh, watch the seminars whenever it's a 
good time for you. Um, so we will come back to Guillaume at the end with more questions, but I, I want to go to uh, Miguel. Uh, Miguel, uh, the family has done a lot of work and study lately on regenerative agriculture and the role of carbon sink when you manage your soil and when you, when you have a holistic approach. Uh, I know that Alan Savory has highly inspired you in, into that. And for those of you who have watched Kiss the Ground, you will see uh, Alan Savory. Uh, I really encourage you to watch that movie. Um, it will give you hope. Um, so Miguel, I'm very interested to hear uh, what you have to, to share with us on those research. Well, Michelle, thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation, because uh, really I cannot think a better uh, issue to talk about than regenerative viticulture in this uh, time and moment. Huh? I think it's, it's very, very important in the world of wine. Huh? So um, um, I'm gonna try to, to be fast with my presentation, but I think I have some, some important things to, to talk about. Uh, what is regenerative viticulture and, and uh, which are the practices that, that we are doing, okay? So next. Uh, so just uh, for you to know, for the people that are looking at us or, or that they don't know us so well, uh, we are Familia Torres, we are in Spain, uh, vine growers since the 16th century. I would say that this is almost like a miracle, no? But making wines with our own name, with uh, Familia Torres name since 1870 and 100% fa family owned uh, winery. Huh? Next, please. So uh, this, is, uh, this is an important chart because uh, this, this is what we realized in 2008. Here we realized about the climate change and everything made sense on the sense that uh, we were having early, earlier harvest, uh, the ripening was coming sooner and sooner, a loss of acidity, higher alcohol. And then as a family, we believe that, that we, we had to do something because, you know, Michelle, I, I want my kids to maybe continue making wines in the future. And we had to start this, this fight no? to mitigate these effects about the climate change. So next, please. So uh, from that point, uh, we started this program that we call Torres and Earth. This is a kind of a puzzle, you know, of uh, different projects, but they all have the same purpose and objective, you know, to reduce our carbon emissions. And from this point, we work through all the process, all the channel, uh, convincing our suppliers to also reduce their carbon footprint because their carbon footprint is also our carbon footprint, working and investing hard in, uh, in our own energies, in uh, photovoltaic panels, in solar panels, in biomass boilers, in geothermal energy, making our wineries more efficient, working with vehicles that would be electric or hybrid, uh, better storing our water, um, planting a lot of forests. We have been planting a lot of forests too. And, and this year in particular, we also, is the first year that, that we actually have been successful on capturing the carbon uh, of the fermentation. So it's a, a process of uh, capturing and reusing again, the carbon dioxide that comes from the fermentation of the wines. Next, please. So uh, with uh, these projects, we have achieved to reduce by 34% our carbon footprint. If we compare uh, with 2008, and that's a reduction per bottle, okay? Uh, and now we are focusing on reducing up to 60% uh, on a maximum time of 2030 and, and hoping to be uh, already carbon neutral before 2050. Our internal objective is uh, 2045. Right? Next, please. So uh, for if there's any winemaker or winery that are listening to, to us, I would like to, to convince them, you know, to join us uh, in this association. It's called International Wineries for Climate Action, uh, founded by, by my father, by my family and the Jackson family. We're a lot of families here uh, that uh, we have set very high standard in order to reduce the carbon. And this is not talking, you know, this is action, you know. Uh, uh, there are a lot of actions that, uh, that you have to do in order to be part of and a lot of uh, critical objectives that you have to fulfill in order to, to be part of this association. But we want to show that a change in the industry is possible. Next, please. So uh, among all the projects that, that we're doing, maybe there are, there are two or three that, that 
you know, uh, we did not expect, but they have become a reality and they are changing the things that we are making wine. No? This picture that you can see here, for example, is the highest vineyard ever planted in the history of the Priorat. Huh? You know, the Priorat, a, a very classic uh, red wine region in Catalonia, in Spain. Uh, here we are planting at 750 meters high, the highest mountain there, okay? So we are discovering new scenarios uh, in order to mitigate these effects of the climate change. We're planting in the, in the Pyrenees, in the pre-Pyrenees, in the highest mountains of the Penedes, or even in uh, Chile, in the Southern Chile, uh, where we have a winery there as well as too. Next. Uh, one of the projects that I particularly love that I'm doing with my sister is to recover all these ancestral varieties we have been many, many years, we already have recovered 60 ancient varieties from before the phylloxera, varieties that were at the point of extinction. Uh, most of the times it only was like one vine. And we have discovered that some of these vines have amazing capabilities to really uh, deal better with the climate change because some of them, they arrive very late, they have an amazing acidity and, and they are very resistant to, to the lack of water. No. So uh, I can tell you right, right now that the, most of the varieties that we're planting today, they are these ancestral varieties. Mm -hmm. Next, please. So um, still, you know, with, with all this COVID thing and, and all this confinement, I, I can tell you that uh, it was a great opportunity to spend a lot of time in the vineyard, you know. We, we, did not, we could not travel, we could not do a lot of things that we used to do. So we, we had a lot of works in the vineyard. And, you know, there were still some questions, you know, we were uh, trying to, to fight against the climate change, but there's some questions that we did not have an answer. No? Like, for example, well, you know that we are certified organic viticulture, even in Chile, we have some biodynamic vineyard there, but uh, we, we saw that none of these models was really focused 100% on the uh, carbon capture and the carbon emissions, no? Uh, we, we, we also see how, for example, in Europe, the soils in the past 50 years, they have lost 50% of the fertility. It's, it's amazing. You know, this, the, the, the soils of the vineyard are becoming more and more poor because we, we have used them so, so much and we have never recovered them somehow. No? So the, the biodiversity is, uh, the biodiversity loss is accelerating uh, very fast. And the erosion of the soils of the vineyard in general, all around the world, it's, it's, it's very hard to, it's, it's, it's really a, a difficult situation, no? So with, with all these questions, my father was always asking me, well, we, we have to plant more forests also in, in order to capture more carbon. And my question was like, why forests capture carbon and vineyards do not capture carbon, okay? What, what is the difference? And here, next, Please is is where where I um, where I start to see things in a different way. You know, this is for example, you know, a vineyard that we can find in in Spain. It could be perfectly organic cer cer certified, but you know, you can see the effects of erosion. Uh, they are very very hard, and still, you know, uh, you can pass the tractor here over and over, over and over, and it's still organic viticulture. So. I've always been a great defensor of organic viticulture, but it has come to the point that I see that it's not enough. So I believe in organic viticulture, but also we have to do something more than organic viticulture. Next, please. So here you can see, for example, this is the, is the point, this ball that you can see here in the middle of the trunk is the insert between the Vitis vinifera and the American rootstock, okay? This point of insertion, it used to be touching the ground. And now it's in the air. And you know why this happens? Because we have lost all this soil because of the rain. Every centimeter that we lose, every vertical centimeter is 134 tons of the best soil of the richest soil that we lose in the vineyard. This is really dramatic. Yeah? We continue next, please. And still, you know, uh, my, my father told me that it was, uh, it's important to till, you know, because his uh, father, my grandfather, told him, you know. So we have all these practices that maybe in a certain period of time in the history, they, they had sense, you know, like removing the herbs, you know, all the bad vegetation to having all the vineyard clean. 
But the question is, do they have sense today? Do they have sense to today what our grandparents were doing? Maybe, may, maybe not, right? Next, please. So, uh, like, like you, Michelle, I, I saw this documentary of Kiss the Ground, and I, and I bought the book from Alan Savory, you know, and I have to say, it inspired me a lot. You know, I recommend everybody to read this book. It's called Holistic Management. It's, it's a book that it, it maybe can change your life. It changed my life, I can tell you. And I met him, and since that day, he has been a great inspiration for me and a great mentor. We, we continue here. Next. So uh, Alan, you know, I have to say, he has no idea about wines. You know, he has no idea about viticulture, you know. And I was tasting wine with, with, with him, and I can tell you, he doesn't know about wines, but he knows a lot about soils, you know. And he has a great experience from the place that we all come from Africa, you know. And he analyzed, he discovered that when a soil is very degraded, it doesn't recuperate by itself. Or if not, it takes a lot, a lot of years to recuperate, you know. When a soil has lost fertility, it's, it's a very bad situation. But in Africa, nature has a way to recuperate these soils. And it's with large herds. These large herds come into a certain place altogether, and they defecate, they urinate, they fertilize the soil, and they eat the grass, okay? And these herds, the next thing that they do is that they move. They don't come back there, okay? And that dynamic is very important. That dynamic of the animals regenerating these soils is what really makes the soils alive again, okay? Next, please. So, Basically, you know, we can talk a, a, about a lot of things of regenerative viticulture, but you can simplify it on a very simple thing, okay? It's a simple, it's a simple concept. Regenerative viticulture is to mimic nature. What we, you don't know what to do, you have to think what nature would do, what a forest would do, okay? So, next please. So, basically, to do that in the vineyard, we have to work with uh, uh, with uh, cover crops, with uh, with the grass, okay, uh, having the ground cover, okay. But it's not enough to just have grass. This is not enough. We have to activate what we call the carbon pump, okay, because the carbon pump is what it allows the carbon to really stay in the ground. All this grass is gonna take the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and is gonna grow and make these roots, okay. So every time in a while, we have to imitate nature and we have to come with sheep or with mechanical ways. We have to cut this grass. Every time we cut this grass, the grass cannot hold all these roots, okay? And it's going to leave part of the roots in the soil, okay? These are chains of carbon that are going to stain the soil, okay? So then we're going to spend a period of time letting the grass grow again. And we're going to do that again. So it's like letting it uh, you know, grow and cut it again, let it grow and cut it again. This is the carbon pump and is what allows us to capture the carbon in the soil and to create this humus. You know, the, the, the humus is this uh, um, complex uh, soil that you can find in the forest that smells like uh, life, like uh, fungus, like a forest. We're trying to imitate that in the same vineyard. Next, please. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm so convinced that this is what we have to do in the vineyards, that we have decided to turn all our vineyards. We're talking about 1,700 vineyards in Spain and in Chile, all to regenerative viticulture. And that's what we are doing, okay? Uh, we, we, uh, we already will, uh, we have started, but in the time of 10 years maximum, all these vineyards will have to already have passed to regenerative viticulture. Next, please. So uh, two of the vineyards that, that we started, uh, the, the two pilots, you know, where we are experimenting and where, where we are doing all, all the things about regenerative viticulture, one is Mas la Plana and the other is Mas de la Rosa. Mas la Plana is in the Penedes. And you know, I love this vineyard, this is a family vineyard. It has a, a, a lot of clay and calcareous soil. 
and and it has also one great advantage is that i live right there okay and this allows me to really see every single step that we are doing in the vineyard and that's very very important to be very close to what is going on because we have to do changes we we have to uh, you know there's not a perfect recipe there's not a perfect book that you can do in every vineyard so at the beginning especially you have to be very close and the in the other vineyard the mas de la rosa this is probably the, the hardest vineyard that we have in terms of soil. We're talking about slate, slate soil, pure rock soil in slopes that sometimes can reach 40 degrees. This is also a learning process. If we can achieve to make regenerative viticulture here, I can tell you we can do it everywhere because it's probably one of the most difficult places to do it. Next, please. So, um, from now on, we not only have to be experts on growing vineyards, we have to be experts on ground cover, okay? And this means that we really have to understand how the grass works. We have to understand, for example, and we are working with universities because this has a scientific approach. This is not just a romantic approach. This is very scientific. We have to understand which kind of grass can actually capture more carbon in the soil which kind of grass can help on purposes, like for example, pulling out the copper that we have in the soils, which kind of grass can increase more biodiversity in the soils, okay? And I can tell you that there are not deep studies done on that. This is an open door to viticulture that we are starting now. Next. So uh, this is, for example, a map of Massa Plana uh, divided into the different parcels. I mean, in each parcels we're working with different kind of uh, vegetation of grass. Uh, sometimes it's a spontaneous grass, but in many times we, we plant many different seeds. And this is something that, that we analyze and we see which is going to be the evolution and which one works better for each parcel. Mm -hmm. Next. So um, to... To, be, to become or to, to make the change to regenerative viticulture, at the beginning, you have to help the soils. It's like if you, if you have someone that is in the hospital, you cannot ask that person to really run a marathon, okay? You have to, to, to do a training, you know, help him. And, and the thing is that we have to help the soils to recuperate. And for that, we need to increase the organic matter in the soils. Just the contrary that some years ago they were telling us. So we, are, we, are, we have to increase this organic matter. And we can do that with compost, like, like it's done in many times in biodynamic uh, agriculture, but also with animals, okay? But it's not enough of having the animals in the vineyard. Okay, this is not regenerative viticulture. Regenerative viticulture is moving and having the right dynamic of the animals in the vineyard. So you have to come up with a plan where the animals have to be each three days or a week. This is something that you can calculate in each parcel and they have to eat that grass. They have to cut that grass. They have to urinate. They have to defecate and immediately they have to go to the next Parcel. We have to imitate nature like, like an animal would come to the forest and would not come back there for a while, okay? So for, for that, we, we have our own herd, but unfortunately, a lot of politicians or you know, laws that we have here, they don't allow us to have more, more ships. We are fighting with those bureaucrats, I have to say, but we uh, are working with shepherds uh, that are here, for example, in the Benedict here are some so that we can use their sheep and they come and we teach them how to do the grazing based on the regenerative concepts. Mm -hmm. Next. So in the summertime, Spain can be very hot in the, in the Mediterranean area. So we can find that uh, our, our grass gets, gets more uh, yellowish, uh, more, more like hay, but this actually helps us a lot, you know, because uh, in Spain can be very sunny, can be very hot. If you could put your, your hand under this carpet of grass, it is amazing how much uh, cooler is there than in the outside, you know? So uh, it is amazing because uh, it has, it keeps the soil at a much cooler temperature, but also it, uh, it makes uh, less erosion into the soil. Uh, it brings more organic matter into the soil. So actually it becomes very positive. And when the first uh, uh, rains come after the summer, it becomes green again, okay? It is, it is very important, this part. 
the, the soil has to be covered the whole year. Very important in regenerative viticulture. Next. So regenerative viticulture is, is, is not against using uh, you know, the machinery that we uh, traditionally have, have used in the vineyard, but we have to use it in a different way. For example, tilting the soil is not what you would do in regenerative viticulture. You cannot plow the soil because every time that you plow the soil, you actually expose all the organic matter that you have and all the carbon dioxide that it, all the carbon that was there in the in the soil, it goes back in the atmosphere. You so you lose everything there. Okay. So the thing is is not to till on a conventional way. If the soil is very compact, you can cut it with a kind of plow that is called the, the uh, yeomans, for, for example. There are other kinds, but it's basically cutting it like a knife, but not moving it, okay? Uh, you know, you, you will not move it in a forest, right? So it's the same thing. You can imitate some of the things that the, that the sheep or the, uh, or the animals do, for, for example, with a roller, uh, putting the grass down, okay? You can bring the, the, the bacteria and the fungus that you can find in the forest nearby and spray it into your own soil so you can create more biodiversity. You can uh, uh, put more compost too in order to recover these, these soils and help them, especially the first years. It's very important to help these, these soils. And by the way, uh, we are already starting to practice with our first uh, electric tractor as well. Huh? Next. So um, when, when you come here, you can also see things that we have done, you know, uh, like uh, putting more insectariums uh, with uh, also these uh, biological corridors, the beehives, the nest, uh, for uh, this pond for amphibious. And all these, you know, we are also now starting to plan in key line, which is fantastic. And it's also important of the regenerative agriculture. But, but all these things, are very nice to see and that they're beautiful. But the most important thing is not this. The most important thing is what happens in the soil, what you cannot see, this microbial life, this life that is coming. Next. So uh, to regenerate the soil, it may take you between five and 10 years. But I can tell you something. From the first year that you start, you can see how nature takes control. And this is something that is beautiful, beautiful. You can see grass coming back there. You can see how the microbial life starts to grow and to blossom again. You can see that nature takes charge. Yeah? Very, very important. It will take years to, to, to come to a level of fertility that we want, but you can already see from the first years a change. Okay, So I would like to encourage everyone, you will see this change also in your vineyards. Next. You can see, for example, this is a state that we have where we make a Chardonnay, the Milmanda state. In the past, we used to have great prawns with erosion. You can see the rains here in the left and, and coming and taking all this beautiful soil to the rivers and then to the sea. You know, we don't have any more problem of erosion. All our best soil stays in our vineyard. Eh? You can see the image of the right. It's a, it's a huge difference. We are preserving the best thing that we have. Next. You can see also an image of the Priorat with the terraces, no? Uh, that because of erosion, roots come out, you know, and it's a difficult uh, picture, difficult circumstance to see, right? And you can see in the right, you know, how everything stays in the right place there. Huh? Next. So what you have to remember about regenerative agriculture is that regenerative agriculture is what really is the only agriculture that we know today that captures the carbon into the soil, back in the soil, you know? Well, conventional agriculture, if you are tilting, you know, if you are plowing, if you see a tractor moving, you know, and, and all this is soil naked, this is bringing CO2 to the atmosphere, okay? So this is contributing actually to the climate change. So from now on, when you see a vineyard, you will think about this, okay? If it's not, not covered, this is, this, there is a problem there. Next, please. How this is going to affect into the wines? Well, this is a th so, something that we'll learn with time. But what we are for, for sure is that 
a soil that is more spongious, that can capture more water, you know, that, that has more, more life, uh, will have less chances of this ripening blockage that, we, that, that you can have when the climate conditions are very hot or very hot. Probably we're going to find more fresher character into the wine there. And the most important thing, I think that the wines are definitely going to be more consistent because one thing that climate change brings is these climatic events and these big changes from vintage to vintage. Having better soils is something that can help us to mitigate these effects. Next. Um, well, I'm, I'm so, you know, I, I, I love so much, so, so much the regenerative viticulture that, uh, that I decide to convince everyone in Spain to start doing regenerative viticulture. That's why in, in June in Spain, I made the first symposium in the history in Spain talking about this, where we invite some of the best experts also around the world and Alan's, Sibori gave us a fantastic message there. And we're trying to, to teach, you know, the vine growers uh, to, to work in a different way. Um, we are we're trying to change, to change the things here. Actually, next month, we're going to announce the first association of regenerative viticulture uh, here in Spain, where we are going to share a lot of practices, a lot of videos, because one of the most difficult things for a vine grower is to make the change when they don't know what is going to happen. A lot of people think, oh, I'm going to lose my harvest. Oh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to produce less, uh, you know, kilos, you know, whatever thing. We want to show like other people have tried and they are working great. So we don't have to be scared about this change. Next. So just, just to finish, you know, uh, I have three, three kids. I cannot really think about anything else that I can do better for them than leave them with a better soil than the one that, that I receive, you know? And uh, I think the best thing that we can do for the future generations. And just something to think about, okay? There are 7,400,000 hectares of vineyards in the world. And you believe what we could do if all these millions of hectares were on regenerative viticulture, all the millions of tons of carbons that we could capture again in the vineyard. We can think that every glass of wine would actually help our planet to heal a bit more, okay? So I, I think that is a dream, and, uh, but it's a dream that is possible. And I hope that, that a lot of people can, can join. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. It's so inspiring. And um, I know you sent me the link to watch uh, those videos from the conference. Can everyone have access to those videos? I think it's online, right? Oh, oh yes, yes, yeah. yes. They, they, they can see it on the website, is, uh, is uh, the uh, Asociación de Viticultura Regenerativa. I can pass the information later on, and the videos are still still on. And in the new website, there's going to be these videos and a lot more, okay? So there's going to be a lot more information about that. I really encourage you to, to go. I've watched them all, and it's something that you want to watch over and over again. There's some so great information and really demystifying one, uh, one word at the time, what is regenerative agriculture and how to, to further uh, sequester carbon. So uh, please go. I don't know if you can, Miguel, maybe put the link in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. If not, I will send it to everyone. But um, if you look in the chat, you can make sure that everyone has the link because I think it's something that we really want to share with everyone. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Miguel. I will come back afterwards. Uh, but I want to go to, to Johan, um, which to me, it's, it's kind of the way to put everything together. Um, Johan, you were the first winery in South Africa to be uh, Demeter certified in 2006. But from the very, very beginning, since you started your work, uh, you were convinced that the way to the future was without using uh, chemicals. And you first went to organic. And then along the way, you met a lady, I believe, who who is really uh, was not working in, in vine, but had an amazing garden and convinced you of uh, the benefits of biodynamic, biodynamic agriculture. But I think what's fascinating about your story beyond that is the way you have really found a way to uh, collaborate with your community and uh, really embracing that holistic approach to agriculture, which I think without doing that, all of what we're talking about is not possible. Um, I, I won't tell your story because I think you do a, a very good job of it. And every time you tell it, I have tears in my eyes. But 
maybe you can tell us about your background and how you got here and um, uh, your philosophy at, at Hennequin, how you work with, uh, with a population that sometimes is difficult, they're poor, they live on the township. Uh, Michelle, thank you so much. Um, thank you also to my, my colleagues for their beautiful presentations. It was fascinating to listen to you. And uh, thank you to my neighbor. I'm sitting in my neighbor's house. On va revenir. We're going to come back to Johan. Um, I received an email from him in the middle of the night uh, saying that they had a big power outage in South Africa and he went to his neighbor and they were on the regenerator. <laughs> so I think uh, he said to me, if you know, if it happens, it, it only takes a few seconds and I can connect again. Uh, while we're waiting, Miguel, um, you put a link, but I believe you sent it. You sent the link just to the panelists. So you just need to, to send the link to everyone. Uh, to make sure they receive it. While we're waiting for Yuan to come back, we received a lot of questions. So I'm going to have questions for Guillaume and Miguel while we're waiting for Yuan to, to connect again. Um, so one of the questions was about soil. Um, Miguel, you mentioned that uh, you know, you mentioned that ob obviously with uh, Priorat, it showed that regenerative agriculture can be done anywhere. But would you say that uh, if you look at some parts of the world where the soil is very poor, it is more difficult? And what would you tell people, which advice you would give people um, to encourage them to persevere if it's a bit more difficult in, in the climate and in, in the soil condition they're in? Mm -hmm. Well, basically, uh, every vineyard is different on that side, but uh, in all the vineyards at the beginning, you, you, you have to do a change. You have to in incorporate more uh, organic matter. You can do that uh, through a compost that you can create from a farm nearby or that you can do ourselves. But also you can work with animals. No? For example, in the Priorat, uh, we, uh, we have looked for which kind of animals can we uh, use the best um, for example, I can tell you goats, I don't recommend the goats because they are, you know, they are, they're very friendly, but they eat everything, you know, and they are going to eat all your vineyards. Uh, sheep are, um, are okay, but they have some difficulties on, on climbing. So in the, in the period, we're experimenting more with chicken because chicken, you know, also you can imitate what a, what a wild bird would do that, you know, and it would also help to increase uh, the, the organic matter in the soil. No? Uh, there are certainly soils that, uh, especially when you have more, more clay, this change that we are talking about is going to be much faster. Okay, When, when you have less, uh, less clay and there are soils where the mother rock is more in the surface side, it's going to take more time, you know, but it's, uh, but it's a process, basically. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Miguel. Uh, I will come back for a panel discussion, but we do have Yuan back. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I hope <laughs> you can, can you see me and hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, I do apologize, man. I'm sitting here right on the southern tip of Africa. I'm a long way away. Um, we have load shedding in our country at the moment. I'm in a neighbor's house working from a generator. So I'm doing my best. Um, in any case, I was going to say thank you for my um, co-presenters for the beautiful presentations and thank you for your opportunity. But let me go back to the, to the beginning. So my journey into the world of wine was a very different one. I studied uh, philosophy, environmental ethics, but as a student, we always need to get a job, you know, so we can buy some wine while we study. And the job that I got was as a farm worker or as a farm laborer, which was unique for South Africa because we have an unfortunate political history of apartheid. And in that, uh, people of color used to do all the hard manual work in the vineyards and um, Caucasian people like myself were lucky enough to be included, you know, in the mainstream economy. 
So two things happened. Um, while I was studying in the evening, I read about nature and about how we are impacting on our natural environment. Nature is becoming smaller and smaller and people are becoming more and more. And we cannot act the same way that we always did. We have to change things a bit. So I wanted to, you know, I think with knowledge comes obligation and all these things that I was reading in the evenings, I could not just forget about them in the day when I went into the vineyards to work. And to be a, a farm worker to me was also not the greatest um, when I had to work with harmful chemicals because I would get a can of chemicals that I would have to spray. And, um, you know, you see the, the skull and the crossbones and you must wash your hands and you mustn't eat and you mustn't smoke because these things are very dangerous. So... What I was reading in the evenings told me to stop, and what I was experiencing in the day in the vineyards convinced me to stop. And then I stopped, and it was a disaster. I had um, weeds, I had downy mildew, I had powdery mildew, I had a whole host of pests eating my vineyards, and I did not know what to do because I honestly believed I was doing the right thing. I was loving Mother Nature. And clearly she wasn't loving me back. And I met this lady who, who was a, a doyen of organics and biodynamics and also regenerative agriculture. And she came to the farm and she explained to me and she said to me, Johan, you are organic by neglect. You must become so by design. Um, it's not good enough just to remove the herbicides and the pesticides and the fungicides from your business. You must understand why farmers use those products. They use them because they have to, not because they want to. And if you don't want to use them, you will have to find other solutions for those problems. So the first lesson to me was that I was actually farming with two things. Um, in the short term, I was farming with grapes, with my vineyards. But in the long term, I was actually farming with soil. So I was looking after the vineyards so I could put my children through school and send them to university. But if I wanted them to also to be able to live on this beautiful farm one day, I would have to look after the soil. Now, these things can seem at a bit of, 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 of like a paradox. If you're at home and you try to grow vegetables or flowers, the first thing you will do is you will remove all the weeds because you want all the nu nutrients and the moisture to go to your plants that you are trying to grow. But at the end of the day, if you go and walk in the wilderness, you never see bare soil. All the soil is covered by plants because that is how soil lives. So what was I supposed to do? Was I supposed to remove the weeds for the sake of the vines? Or was I supposed to leave them there for the sake of the soil? And the person who really helped me there was a, a Dr. Uwe Hoffmann from Geisenheim University in Germany. And he explained to me that if you take a short-term view, it seems like a paradox. But if you take a long-term view, it becomes a synergy. They actually feed off each other. And he showed me the scientific studies that they had done. And this is a long time ago. This was before the year 2000. That if you can build soil humus to 5%, the plants that live there, their resilience can increase by as much as 300%. And where I live, I happen to have some of the oldest and most extensively weathered soils anywhere in the world. Um, if you take a spade into a conventional vineyard in Europe and you measure the humus, you're probably going to get about 2 to 3%. On our farm, we were lucky if we got 05 to 0.7%. So how did we build our humus levels to 4.3%? And how did we manage to farm with soil and with vines at the same time? 
So I don't want to talk about it for too long because my colleagues actually explained a lot of the details already. But I think the first thing that I, I tried to do was to understand how one builds soil humus. And on paper, it's relatively easy to do. You need a lot of organic material and you need microbial activity. And the microbes then convert the organic material into humus. So I set off planting plants that gave a lot of organic material, typically your, your grass species, like oats or rye or triticale. And I grew them and I never sprayed them because the moment you spray them with a herbicide, they turn to dust. So I just flattened them with a, a, a tire behind my tractor. I couldn't afford a roller. And it worked. And then I would inoculate them with beneficial microbes. And there we exper experimented. I bought some microbes from a Dutch multinational com company. I used some microbes, uh, EM, effective microorganisms from Japan. And I also experimented with preparation 500, which is a biodynamic preparation, the, the horn manure, which is also very rich in microbial activity. Um, of the three, I think the preparation 500 and the microbes I bought from the Dutch multinational were the most effective. But if you, if you looked at the costs, there was just no comparison. And the preparation 500 was by far the most affordable and easiest way for me to bring life to my soil. And after three or four or five years of farming this way, it was amazing to see the soil. The soil was always covered. It looked like I pulled a blanket over it in the summer months. I could walk into my vineyards and push my hands into the soil. I could dig out the earthworms. And everybody came, who came to the farm were amazed. They would walk across the border to a neighboring farm and the soil would be rock hard in the middle of summer. They come into our vineyard and the soil was soft and rich and beautiful and full of earthworms. And I thought it was wonderful, except that all of a sudden my yields plummeted. They fell overnight. So as a conventional farmer, I was harvesting about eight tons per hectare. My dream for organics was about six tons per hectare. It worked like that for the first three to five years of conversion. And then my yields dropped to about two or three tons per hectare. Now this is a, a very big problem because when people talk about sustainable agriculture, they think of, of nature. But in my mind, sustainability is a three-legged chair. The one leg is nature, the other leg is people, and the other leg is money. And if you don't have those three legs in place, the chair will eventually fall over. It's sad, but it is true that we can exploit nature the longest and get away with it, people the second longest, but the moment we run out of money, our business stops almost overnight. So I had to be very, very aware that my approach to be a sustainable farmer was not just sustainable from an ecological point of view, but also from a, a, a people point of view and also from a monetary point of view. So I was trying to understand why well, my yields had dropped so significantly and there was a microbiologist from the University of Stellenbosch, or she was actually University of Cape Town at the time, Professor Barbara von Wegma. And she explained to me that if you want to build the perfect compost heap on your farm, you use one part of nitrogen for every 30 parts of carbon. So one spade of cow manure for every 30 spades of, of grass cuttings, you will then put moisture and oxygen in and layer them, and that will build beautiful compost. But with me, I had grown so much organic matter on my farm that my ratio went one to 500. And in its endeavor to build itself, the soil was sucking all the available nitrogen. And as a consequence, my yields dropped overnight. So I had to do two things. The one is I had to change the plants that I grew there and move away from growing grass species exclusively to really try and introduce legumes, things like beans or peas or clovers that have the ability to fix nitrogen and put that in the soil. 
And the second thing is I had to introduce animals because in nature, as was so beautifully illustrated before, uh, plants cannot exist without animals and animals cannot exist without plants. So if you want to farm with plants and you don't want to introduce animals, you will have to introduce synthetic or artificial fertilizers. And I personally find them problematic because they acidify the soil, they leach out, they kill your mi microbes and your earthworms and everything else. So living not too far from, from, well, I suppose, compared to everybody else watching, I'm, I'm quite close to where Alan Savory did his research. And it fascinated me because what actually happens on the Serengeti is you have the predators like the lion and the hyena, and then they bunch the herbivores. And when they bunch them, they eat indiscriminately. They eat not just the nice tasting grasses, but also the, the bad ones. And like, like Miguel explained so well, when they eat the top, the roots also die back from the bottom and they defecate and they urinate in that space and all their microbes then start to convert that decaying root matter to, to humus. So I can't have lions and, and buffalo and, and wildebeest on my farm, but I have a tractor battery and a little electric wire and I have a herd of about 25, 30 cows. They are Nguni. They are indigenous to Africa. Um, they are products of evolution. They were not bred for meat or for milk. Uh, they can carve easily. They don't get problems with ticks. They're fantastic cows. And what I do is I start on one side of the vineyard in the winter months. And then we bunch them and we do the high density grazing and we take them through the entire farm. And when we reach the end, we start at the beginning again. And we try and get this herd to move through our vineyards at least five times every season. And then when the vines start to bud, I have to remove them out of the vineyard or they will eat my grapes. But I still have to somehow manage my weeds because I need a sustainable yield. So there is no golden recipe there. I look at the season in a very dry year, like we had in 20, sort of 16, round about there. I must be careful that my yields don't drop too low. And then I farm a bit more aggressively weed management and I make sure I have sustainable yields. But in other years, like the one we have now and the one we have last year, we have higher rainfall then it gives me an opportunity to focus more on farming with soil and to build the soil. But I want to tell the people who haven't started, it is completely possible to do this. Uh, we've taken our humus levels from 0 0.5 and 0.7%, they're up at about 4.3% now. And to farm organically and biodynamically has actually become a lot easier over the last 20 years. I don't want to talk too much about farming, I just want to add Two little things before I, 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 I talk about the importance of people. If you look at pests, I, I agree. I also look in nature for solutions. So if you have a problem with, 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 with snails, you can just Google who or what eats snails, and the obvious answer would be ducks. So I would take my truck, and I would go over the hill to the duck farm, and I will buy 200 ducks, and I'll bring them to the farm. They will eat all my snails and they will put manure, which is rich in nitrogen for all the vines to grow beautifully. Those, those are easy solutions. Some of them are a bit more complex. We have a leaf roll virus in South Africa. And when this virus infects your vineyard, it cannot pr produce chlorophyll and it cannot photosynthesize properly and it doesn't ripen your grapes properly. So when I was a farm worker, we had to given a product to, to spray a little insect, a mealybug that was spreading this virus through its saliva. Today, I know that this insect wants to live on the root of a, a dandelion. Uh, it also happens to be one of the biodynamic preps. And the dandelions are in all vineyards that used to be farmed conventionally because the soils are typically very hard and very compact. The dandelion has this beautiful tap root. Nature sends it. It knows which plants to send. And I saw that this insect that causes all the problems in the vineyard actually prefers to live on the, the root of the dandelion. So some vineyard, uh, vineyard pests we, we, we manage with animals. Some of them we, we manage with, with plants. 
And then if you look at fungal disease, I think organics and, and, and biodynamics probably get a very bad name because they use copper in their sprays. But I want to tell the, the viewer that this is a very old form of, of organic farming. And just like conventional farming has progressed, so has organics and biodynamics as well. So these days we hardly use any copper whatsoever in our vineyards. Um, in a very difficult year, I might use copper twice uh, in the flowering stage, but in most years we don't. And the solution is just like ducks eat snails, trichodermia eats downy mildew. And like a cow gives you cow manure, the trichodermia gives you metabolite. And when you spray this metabolite on your vines, it increases the Brix levels or the sugar levels of your plants. And then they're not as susceptible and vulnerable to, to disease. So there are much softer and gentler ways to farm this way. Um, I don't want to say too much about biodynamics. I think Guillaume did a beautiful explanation on that as well. The only thing that I would like to add is to me, the difference between a conventional, or let's rather say an organic and a biodynamic farm, is that an organic farm tries to be sustainable and a biodynamic farm tries to be self-sufficient. So if I farm just with grapes, and I might farm regeneratively with grapes or organically with grapes or conventionally with grapes, I will create waste at my wine cellar. If I've in the pips and the stems and the skins after harvest, if I farm with cows, whether I farm with them organically or conventionally, they will put a lot of manure in the area where they sleep and the nitrogen levels can become too high. But the moment I farm with cows and grapes, my problem disappears because I take the waste from the cellar, I give it to the cows. I take the waste from the cows, I give that to the cellar. So when Rudolf Steiner speaks about the farm as an individuality, I understand it as a self-sufficient whole. And this is how I apply biodynamics. So I try to align different organic systems in a synergistic way on the same farm so that they feed off each other. And it makes per perfect sense because if you take one teaspoon of soil, there is more life in that teaspoon of soil, or I should say healthy soil, than there has ever been people on this planet. So if you can just imagine how much life there is out there, in the soil, on the soil, in the air, in the water, and of all living things, there's only one thing that wastes, and that's us. We have breakfast, we have lunch, we have dinner, we eat stuff and we throw stuff away. It's, waste is a completely unnatural concept. It's a cultural concept. And to me, one of the beautiful things about this way of farming is that it helps you to eradicate and to eliminate waste. I also understand that modern agriculture contributes 17% to global warming. So if you take all the contributing factors to global warming, agriculture is a culprit. 17%, it's almost a fifth. But by the same token, it's one of the biggest tools or levers that we have to change this and to make a difference. So I really think it's important. But one step further than this is a weakness for myself, is I always thought of environmental sustainability as how we live and what we do on our farm. But I've recently received a lot of literature. Uh, Jancis Robinson shared a lot of it as well. And it shows you that what we do on our farms is actually quite limited if you consider our total carbon footprint and things like bottle weight and transport and a whole host of other stuff contribute significantly. So as important as it is to do what we are advocating tonight or today, I think it's also important to look beyond the farm gates and to look at other industries and things that we can influence and we can change for the better. Um, I want to say something about people because the question to me, and I wrote it down, Michelle, because it struck a chord with me, is you said, how do you look after nature when you're poor? Now, that's a, a very good question, and it's a difficult one. And it's, it's one of the things that struck me and motivated me to start studying 
I saw an article of a gentleman trying to grow vegetables in a wilderness area in the eastern part of South Africa. And that wilderness area was a UNESCO heritage site. The, the, the wilderness was so endangered and so unique that UNESCO claimed it a heritage site. And there was a gentleman who, who was poor and he lived there and he grew his vegetables. And when a hippopotamus came to eat his vegetables, he shot the hippopotamus. And many people were upset. How can you farm in a, a wilderness area and shoot a wild animal in a wilderness area? But equally, many people were upset. How can you worry about the life of a hippopotamus and not be concerned about the life of a human being? So to me, nature and people need to be seen holistically if you want to understand sustainability. And there are few countries in the world where you become more aware of this than in South Africa, because we have a first world and a third world living 10 minutes from each other with no border control or immigration control. People can walk from the one to the other. You cannot ignore it. It is in your face every day. Makes you think a lot about life and about the planet and about how we should live and, and, and what we should do. And what happened to me was, I was busy pruning Cabernet Sauvignon. It was in August, which in the southern hemisphere is in the middle of winter. It was really cold. And I got so cold that I went back to my house and I put on my wetsuit. I'm a surfer, I love surfing. I put on my wetsuit and then I put my work clothes over the wetsuit. I went back to the vineyard and I saw my colleagues and they were so poor that they had to take newspaper and put the newspaper in their shirt and put the newspaper in their pants and around their feet just to stay warm. And I couldn't understand it, you know. How can wine, which is such a beautiful product, not take care of the foundation of the house? Because the workers in the vineyard, they are the foundation of our house. You cannot make good wine if you don't have good fruit. You cannot have good fruit if you do not have good people. So how can you exploit the workers and expect a beautiful fine wine? And I find it very difficult. So at the time, we went to a number of the farmers in the areas, and I said, please, guys, you need to pay us more. You, know? you can't pay us as little as this. And they said to me, well, you know, at least 30% unemployment rate in South Africa. So if you want to talk minimum wage, go and talk it somewhere else, but not in a country where a third of the population is unemployed. And I then thought maybe nobody is going to help us, we must help ourselves. So we, we, we had no winery, we were working in the vineyards. At that stage, I only had two cows. Today we have 50. I took the two cows out of the cow shed and I made some wine in the cow shed I thought it was wonderful, um, but it was actually terrible, to be honest. And I invited the bank manager to come and visit us. And I said to him, please, sir, uh, lend us some money because we want to start our own wine company. And the gentleman from the bank looked at me and, 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 and he said, you know, you are young and you are idealistic and you've obviously studied philosophy and it's, it's wonderful, your values. But you must understand that very rich people enter the wine industry and they lose a fortune. So here you are, you have no background in viticulture, oenology, or commerce. You only have a degree in philosophy. Most of your, of your fellow workers are illiterate, which was true because they had to leave school when they were young children to help put food on the table for their parents. And he just said that us, we were not what he would see as the ideal group to start a successful wine business. So when somebody tells me I cannot do something or I cannot become something, it, it, it triggers something me and I have to prove them wrong. And I was brought up in a house where my parents taught me that you can become anything that you want to become if you just work hard enough at it. But in fairness, my colleagues, did not have a bicycle or a mobile phone. So for them to sign up to borrow millions of rands from the bank 
for a business that the bank manager tells them to have a very sm slim chance of success. They just declined. They said, no, thank you. And it was a terrible experience for me. And then that night I read another philosopher, a gentleman called Amartya Sen. Um, and Sen said, if you want to empower people or if you want to help them, you need to give them choice, the capability to choose. Because if you take away a person's ability to choose in life, you disempower them. So I thought that was great. It was my dream. Maybe they have their own dream. Doesn't matter as long as they have the choice. So we had another meeting and my colleagues said they would prefer to rather have houses and education than a wine business. And it made perfect sense because they didn't have a house. They could live on the farm, but they had to work on the farm like their parents and their grandparents. And I think they wanted for their children the possibility to become something else. And there's not enough jobs and there's not enough houses. So in any case, sorry, I see I have to wrap up now. Michelle, I'll be quick. All I want to say was we set out, we bought the houses, we promised to send the children to university. It failed dismally. I couldn't give the wine away. No one knew about it. I got lucky. A lady from CNN heard about this story. There was an Africa Journalist of the Year Award. She invited me to bring the wine, to tell the story. I met Nelson Mandela the next day. Um, it was one of the highlights of my life. Today, unfortunately, it's not all perfect. Half of the people sold their houses and pocketed the cash. Some of the kids dropped out, but not all of them did. Some kept the houses, and the one colleague's daughter now runs Reineke Wines. So I just want to leave it with a motto. It's in the book Life of Pi. Neil Magnum Nisi Bonum. There can be no greatness without goodness. And whether we look after people or whether we look after nature or after ourselves, I think it's really important that we don't forget the goodness in our strive to be the best we can be. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very inspiring. Um, I, I cannot tell you, tell you how many um, questions. Can you hear me? No? I can tell you, we have so much question. Um, I, I want to be respectful of the time. Uh, I know it's late for you. It's late for some of the people who are listening. Um, we, uh, you know what I invite all of the speakers to do? If you want to share more links uh, for people who are interested in, in biodynamic, regenerative agriculture so that they can go and read further, the idea with this conference is always to park some interest and encourage people to, to reach uh, for further information. But before we end, though, I would like to ask uh, one by one, uh, we have sommelier, we have wine producer, we have journalists listening right now. Um, if you each had one advice to share uh, for people listening, um, perhaps from the mistakes that you've made, perhaps of the hope that you're seeing uh, that you can leave uh, people with. Um, Guillaume, I will start with you. Um, so, so for, for, for me, the last message uh, of this conference, thank you also of my colleagues, Miguel Torres, Johan, Renick. Uh, I learned a lot about your presentation, your experience, and uh, you know, each presentation, I have some similarity and we have each our point of view, but that's clear that for me, uh, in our way, we find in regenerative agriculture, uh, the way of the resilience and to improve the nature, to improve uh, our sustainability and to improve, uh, you know, the, uh, the well-being of all our colleagues, our, of um, our community. And that's clear that uh, we see that uh, there is a lot of issue 
uh, with uh, the carbon, with with the management of the wine, you know, to 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 manage the wine to keep the freshness. For example, in south of France, we we want to keep the freshness in our wine, the complexity, and that's clear that the issues are very big. But for me, uh, that's clear that all the experience go in the same way, you know, uh, to have a better way to produce and to. I think that and the, 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 the interesting point is that here that in each our experience, we have some uh, bad experience, some good experience. And for me to sum up that here that all we learn and all we unlearn, you know, about the good practice. <laughs> and because when I was student, you know, as Miguel Torres said, that it's clear my father said to me that uh, you have to till to have good grapes. And then I seen that changing my practice, but that's clear that I have better grapes. So that's clear that thank you a lot. And for, for me to, to sum up all the, the issue is that to we, we have a, a good challenge in front of you. And that's clear that uh, uh, we have answer in all our experience. Merci, Guillaume. Um, Miguel. You know, it's, it's hard to summarize, no, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, right now, you know, we, we are seeing all these results from the, this uh, Glasgow uh, cl Climate Change Summit, right? And, and we see, you know, how there's so, so much talk, you know, but we have very little time to fix things. And I think that if we don't really make a step forward all, all together uh, on, on all the areas that we have, you know, some, some people grow uh, graves, but some work in other uh, sectors or in industries, no? Like, I think that the wine is going to be the least of the problems that we're going to have because we are not really going to have a planet afterwards, no? So I think that... Uh, you know, we, we, we cannot trust, you know, on, on you know, politicians to, to change things. I think that it has to be a change from the people and from the work that we are doing. We are, we are not producing oil or petrol, no, we are producing grapes. And, and what, what we can do is to really have an active conscious about what we are doing and try to do as much as we can in order to, to make it sustainable and to fight against the climate change. And to me, the regenerative viticulture um, is, the, is the only solution that we have now in order to use all this land that we have and to really store the carbon again. I can tell you something, you know, uh, some, some time ago, you know, our vineyard managers, uh, ourselves, we were proud, of course, about uh, making grapes and making wine, you know. Now I can see uh even a higher proudness you know every time that we go to the vineyard and we work in the vineyard we really believe that we are helping to heal the planet and this is something that mm -hmm. is much more important than anything else that we have done before and uh it really fills our hearts and our soul and and it has sense to us yeah thank you thank you very much miguel johan michelle when i I started, I was, I was scared. Um, and for everybody else who, who wants to, to, to farm organically, biodynamically or regeneratively and are scared to do so, I just want to read a poem that was given to me by that lady who basically changed my farm and my life and my fortune. And it's a poem from Goethe, or Goethe, and it's on commitment. I'll be quick. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. That the moment one definitely commits oneself then providence moves to. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events issue from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings 
and material assistance, which no man could have dreamed would have come his way. Whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Baldness has genius, magic, and power in it. It is the truth, I promise you. If you just go out and try and do the right thing, you will be amazed how things will happen to make your dreams come true. So just go for it. And you can find any one of us or email any one of us and we'll help you too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johan. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I have had so many comments on the chat. I think everyone is very inspired by uh, the three of you. And as you all said, um, the planet cannot wait. So hopefully from that inspiration that you have today, you will go out and share this information with all of your friends and put in, put in action some of your gesture to make sure that together we are the change. We can be the change. I really believe it. Uh, we all believe it. So let's do it. So thank you so much, everyone. And uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at the same time. Thank you, Guillaume. Thank you, Miguel. And thank you, Johan. Very inspiring. Thank you. <laughs>